there was nothing bigger to me than the Cosby Show and being in front of that TV. I loved going to work. I'm walking down the street and people stop me and they walk up to me and they say, I grew up with you. The Cosby was everybody's dad. I idolized the guy and so did every guest star on the show. I'm an actor who comes from the comedy school of Bill Cosby. It was all I knew. It was my childhood. It was a thrill to see it every week because those of us who have lived this real life know that we are just regular folks doing regular things. And what they did was brought that home to us every week in our living rooms. He never plays a race card. He never deals a profanity card. He never stoops to the base level. And I, I love that. I'll tell you that that is so difficult to do and keep you on the floor. We're here to say goodbye to a cherished friend, Lamont Goldfish. I always felt safe with him around. I brought you in this world, and I'll take you out. If you do, you die. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you two go and get a job and get out of my house? It's the ugliest shirt I've ever seen. But I like my punishment before I go to bed. Welcome, welcome to the show. I guess if someone asked what, what was it about, what is it about, how did it about, <laughs> it was because I was confused. I, I, when I became a parent, I had certain thoughts. And things didn't go according to the thoughts. <laughs> you would think that a person, having been a child, would understand how to raise <laughs> But it, it really doesn't work that way. Um, when we put together a family, you, you, the husband, the wife, they, they start out their lives to become these great people. And, and they become great people. And then they ruin it. it, it, it <laughs> decide to have and then, then you've got to go through things you got to go through teaching things you would think that a young person that you're feeding clothing taking saving the life of would believe you every once in a while when you gave them some information not so said the brown turtle I just want you to understand there's nothing here except a whole bunch of fun, that's all. And I know some of you are jealous because <laughs> this is going on in your home and you're not even being paid. <laughs> get through the days working with Bill without cracking up. Buenos dias! There's no way you couldn't laugh at somebody who did the things that he did. Come on! You have to leave it open and catch the funny. That's what Mr. Cosby says. The script is your roadmap. But the funny things that happen 
are really interactions that can't be scripted. Bill didn't like to over rehearse. Bill just wanted to know basically what the scenes were about, and 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 he would fill in. He didn't want to get too well rehearsed, so we only rehearsed for one day. This is your fort, and you stay in here. If something is not working, then he's going to ad lib, you know, and change it in order to make it work. And uh, the really fantastic thing is that that keeps it fresh. You never know what's going to happen. It's a little bit scary sometimes, yes. Dad, you are undermining everything that Elvin and I believe in. I, I understand, Sandra. I, I deserve everything. I, I just might as well. No, oh, don't come near me. I don't want anybody to stop me because I'm, from this point on, you take another step and I'm a clean man. The fun thing for us is if he went to left field, we had to go to left field with him. I don't Dad, deserve I'm, to let you Dad, come I'm closer. Serious. I will hooverize you. <laughs> and anybody else that comes near me, do you understand? <laughs> It was always fun to walk down onto the Cosby Show set and to see things that didn't appear in the script. And a great example would be, say, uh, Cliff cooking dinner. You'd write in the script, Cliff is preparing dinner. And you walk down on the, sh on the set and he was doing Julia Child. And you really don't have to worry about cheese. <laughs> It was wonderful to work with that kind of spontaneity, to not know what he would do next. I put the key in the ignition, turned the thing, and it went... So I press down on the gas, and you think I'm lying. The car said, what? <laughs> what do you smell? I loved all of the episodes where we got to play someone outside of our regular character. Miss Griswold, could you come here for a moment, please? What do you want, a busy? <laughs> this young man needs a loan, and I do recommend we give it to him. No. But Mrs. Griswold... No! <laughs> Why not? You have nothing! Welcome to Amanda's Furniture City. Where money talks and nobody walks. If you like it, you touch it. If you break it, you buy it. If you don't see it, we don't have it, but we will get it. Now, what can I do for you? It was sort of life lessons through comedy and through um, just kind of going outrageous and overboard to prove a point. Thanks for Rudy, I'm looking so bad. Bill set a tone, I think, doing the show, and that was that anything can happen. Three, Could you two. count funnier? I can't laugh. <laughs> <laughs> he used to have the brightness on the Morrises. Say that. Sign the Brian Mormon. No, no. The brightness on the Mormon fitness. Keisha was always amazing because when we first started, Keisha couldn't read. <laughs> Ron? Mama. Yeah. Sorry, Mama. Mrs. Mrs. Susan. That's right. You could go through the woods, back up the mountain, across the sea before you got to the end. But that was just part of the, you know, joy of what we did. One time he was doing a scene with Keisha and she didn't respond. And so I stopped it and I said, uh, Keisha, you want to take a look at the script? She will. If you tell Mr. Crosby to stop taking my lines, I'd know what to say. Three, two, Touch your mouth. <laughs> you no, it's too late. You're wasting our money. Malcolm was the worst. 
well, he was probably the worst at keeping it together because their scenes were so ripe for Bill to go in and just go nuts. Was that you? <laughs> You want to sell some some meat hooks, some sneakers, <laughs> some bottle bottle. <laughs> if he saw you being able to keep your composure, he turned it up another notch. Dad, can you ask me? Okay, <laughs> to the doctor's lounge. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> the sofa. <laughs> Is that all you want to ask me, Dr. Hustable? Is it <laughs> The thing that would that would always inevitably get us going is when he would break. And sometimes you see him and, and he's trying to hold on and he just starts laughing and you just start laughing. The atmosphere on set was always it was comfortable, it was relaxed, it was creative, it was fast-paced, it was fun. All I know is we left that theater humming the tongues and feeling fine, didn't we, Craig? Humming the what? Song. <laughs> After dinner, they're gonna show a more. <laughs> There's so much room to have fun if you're doing the work. Is that it? That's the hustle. <laughs> For all its success, The Cosby Show almost didn't happen. When Marcy and I initially pitched it to the networks, after developing the idea with Bill, it was summarily passed on by all three networks. Are you telling me that, that, that I'm, I'm not too bright? Almost single-handedly, Bill Cosby and The Cosby Show revived the fortunes of NBC. It was the number one television show for five straight seasons. Yeah! A record still unmatched. What's your name? Keisha. Keisha? And how old are you, Keisha? I'm five years old. Do you know when you'll be six, Keisha? Next year. Next year. Um, Don't look. Who are you looking at over there? No, who are you looking at? Who are you looking at there? Um, that's me. That's Keisha, right? Oh, <laughs> how can you make me on the TV? <laughs> A very wise person once said, a loving family stays together and moves together, but if you could sneak out on the kids, go. <laughs> you know, it really, really moves me to see this entire family here, because we can each take a bag. <laughs> You can take more than that. Real life is funny. You don't have to do it up or over-exaggerate. Just by itself, it is hilarious. And that's what the Cosby Show did. They kept it simple. <laughs> oh, you've come back for the funeral, huh? No, I want some privacy. <laughs> you want to talk to Lamont by yourself? No, I want to use the bathroom. It was a time when people could gather on Thursday and anybody could uh, watch a show. It wasn't, there wasn't a target audience. <laughs> Daddy, oh! <laughs> Let me look at you. So how do I look? Like trash. The show's greatest strength and greatest contribution was that it was so universal. It was just about family. It wasn't a black family, it was a family. Flowers. They're for Sandra. Is she here? Yes. May I see her? Sure. <laughs> Today? It was about parents dealing with raising their kids at its heart and kids dealing with raising their parents and 
siblings relating to each other, and that's something that we all know. Mom, Dad, we can't sleep because Rudy thinks she heard the wolf man growling in our closet. I told her there wasn't such a thing, but she doesn't believe me. Would you tell her? There is no wolf man growling in your closet. Uh-huh! <laughs> there is no wolf man growling in your closet. Uh-huh! Anybody got any other bright ideas? <laughs> Everybody on the set really made it fun for me, and they just embraced me into their family. And I realized, I'm on a television show. This is cool. You know, as a three-year-old, you're like, I'm ready. What's going on? Where the lollipops? What's my lines? I'm ready to go. I can't buy them anything. I'm broke. <laughs> what happened to all your money? I don't know. I bought some bubble gum. <laughs> Father Knows Best, Leave It to Beaver, The Brady Bunch. And I think for the 80s, Cosby represented that for America and for the world at large. Hey, I know. You know what? What you gonna say? And it's under control. So, no, no problem. problem. Right. <laughs> the Huxtables were so incredible, people couldn't believe they were real. And I think part of the reason people couldn't believe they were real was not just because they were so loving, but because it was the first time you'd seen an African-American family portrayed in this light of truth. I, I served you. I served you. Huh? <laughs> That's my girl. Dad, mm -hmm. I can't breathe. You have to understand, dear, that love hurts. <laughs> there was nothing formulaic about the way uh, parents would behave with children, except that there were certain things that were never going to happen. A child was never going to be struck. They might be threatened. Uh, son, your mother asked me to come up here and kill you. I have got a nerve to walk in there and grab that child by her arms and shake her. And children were never going to be disregarded. Think of all the wonderful things five-year-olds can do. You can tie your own shoelaces. You can dial the phone. You can go to kindergarten. Last year, you couldn't do any of that. Because I was nothing. No, you were never nothing. You just weren't five. Five now. And now you can do things that you could never do before. So what do you think about that? Yay, five. Yay, five. Mommy, how old are you? Old. Yay, old. I think the most important thing that you saw were, were, were parents and kids talking. You just didn't see that for a long time on television. It got to the, all the kids were smart alecks and, you know, telling their parents off and slamming doors. And the parents were like, I'm so frustrated. I don't know what to do with this child. That's all crap. Make your point. If you weren't a doctor, I wouldn't love you less because you're my dad. And so, instead of acting disappointed because I'm not like you, maybe you can just accept who I am and love me anyway because I'm your son. It was just wonderful. Any other show, the music would have started. You know, the, the father would have come over to the son and they would have hugged and it would have been beautiful. Theo, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. There's no wonder you get D's and everything. I'm not a parent, but I know tons of parents who have said those exact words to their kid. Now, I'm telling you, you are going to try as hard as you can. And you're going to do it because I said so. I am your father. I brought you in this world, and I'll take you out. <laughs> now, son, come here. Come here. <laughs> now, listen to me. I just want you to do the best you can. That's all. I'll try, Dad. Yeah. I really will. All right. I love you. Yeah, Dad. Huh? I know. Yeah. And maybe 
Your mother loved you too. <laughs> One of the reasons why uh, Cosby worked so well and why the Huxables came off so loving toward each other was because we all as a cast genuinely liked each other. There's nothing like watching Bill and Felicia on screen. It's, I mean, it, there's nothing like it. They have a chemistry that's just, you, you couldn't create it again if you tried. For 22 years I've been married to you. I've been the happiest one day at a time I've ever had in my life. I love the way you beg. <laughs> we could read Macbeth, we could snuggle up under the covers and read Macbeth, and, and it could take all night. <laughs> and I'll be Lady Macbeth. And I'll be the big bad wolf. <laughs> I think that Cliff and Claire Huxtable are without question the most romantic couple in the history of television. A loving family is uh, a family that has uh, unconditional love, and with that, uh, The Cosby Show was able to show that on all different levels. Mm -hmm. Let's just remember, this is how we got the children. <laughs> Everybody tuned in because it was just a good show. It was a good show and it was funny. You know, they had the fly brownstone. Mr. Huxtable had the fly sweaters. His wife was fine. He had kids that looked good. Lisa Bonet, oh good God, everybody was in love with her. I mean, there was no bringing a boyfriend over and just having, you know, him just say, okay, when you bring her home, okay, good night. Did you tell Denise she could go out on a date tonight? Yes, I did. Well, have you seen the boy? Yes, I have. Well, how ugly is he? <laughs> hey! And he enjoyed the terror, you know, that, that we knew it was coming. You were in a parked car with my daughter. Yes, sir. Right. Were you that close in the car? Uh-huh. Were you... <laughs> oh, no way, sir! Uh-uh! No way! No way! Children are basically bad people. Children are people who are selfish, greedy, and, and they will do whatever they can to get what they want. And one of the worst things about being a parent is you find out that yelling means nothing. They are the only people who can yell and get what they want. We are very fortunate to have the children, Cliff. Otherwise, we would never know the joy of leaving them at home. Let's not go back. You mean tomorrow? I mean forever. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Let them have the house, and we'll stay here. And what we'll do is maybe we'll call them when we get old. <laughs> yes. Who had control of the household? Well, I guess it's a toss-up. I definitely think it was the kids. What's going on in there? how to get what they want. Peanut butter, I need turkey! Dad wanted 
to, you know, be in charge, but I don't think that maybe he was ever quite in charge. Come here. Come here. Here, here, here. See, see, there is there. This is here. Come here. He understood his children well enough, and of course he was a kid once too. And he wasn't above becoming like a kid. No putting your finger in your nose. No putting your finger in your nose. And pull out something. <laughs> Rudy, you go and you help mommy in the kitchen, please. Vanessa, go help mom in the kitchen. Now. Do I have to say now? Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, Claire Huxtable was in control of the Huxtable household. There was, there was no question about it. She was the boss. Just have a little taste, dear. This pie is for your mom and dad after dinner. My folks will not notice. They did the last time. How? Because when we cut into it, it was hollow. Rudy, why are you in that dress? Rudy, I told you specifically to take that dress and put it back in the trunk. Now, you are asking for it. Daddy told me to wear it. And don't try to use your father against me, okay? Because he has no idea about such things. Claire always let Cliff think that he was running the show. But we all knew Claire was really running the show. Now, your father and I have given you every advantage in this world, and what do you do? Well, it's like I told don't you. Don't answer me when I'm asking you questions. Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> you think I'm talking just to hear myself talk? Answer me. Now? He's Cliff Huxable was always funny, being able to handle any situation with humor. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Cliff, I didn't know they were hooked to her. <laughs> who everyone would want to have on the block. Bravo. Bravo. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Marvelous. Marvelous. I know a lot of people told me he's the father they wish they had because he seemed like so much fun. <laughs> I think um, Cliff being such a great father was a bit of a mixed blessing that backfired on him. Um, he was such a great father that no one ever really wanted to leave his house. They kept coming back with twins and husbands and children they had acquired and fiancés and boyfriends and oh yes they kept coming back. Hey mom! Hey! Hey dad! It was all the luggage for man. You're not moving back in here are you? Theo <laughs> would moved out. Theo was back. Uh, so I think that uh, you know, reflects the dilemma that uh, a loving parent goes through. Your kid leaves and your kid needs to come back. <sighs> you really don't want this kid back at your house, but what you gonna do? So you guys are saying I can't move back in? I think you're getting close to it. <laughs> you mean you're gonna send me out there without a home in the cold and the rain? The same cycle went through each and every child. They'd leave, then they'd come back, and they'd stay. And he was like, you might be leaving now, uh, little girl, but you'll be back. You've seen people who have tried to leave, and, and they didn't leave. The scientists call it a vacuum effect. And this is where people really try to leave this house. 
but they keep uh, getting sucked back in. <laughs> I'm gonna be the, 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 the vacuum. Yeah? Now you you go and go for the door. Go for it. You see? Mm, it's pull it. Say Singapore. 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 Grab the door. Turn the knob. Turn the knob. This is the tough part. Singapore. Tomorrow. We gotta go. Singapore. You keep taking in these little urchins, you're never going to get any privacy. So I don't know what they were really expecting. Now, you and I have been beaten every time we've gone to battle. And I'm telling you now, darling, <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> and you're old too, Claire. <laughs> and I think that you and I should just get on up and get out of here. Get in the car and and just go. Let them have the house, honey. They kept coming back because it was comfortable, <laughs> because it was a nice household, and because they knew the bottom line, no matter how annoyed somebody might be, there was a lot of love. Yeah, so they kept coming back. I'd like to introduce you to the woman who had full control of the home. Uh, dear, will you please come out? You, you hear your name called. You are called Dad. And then follows, can I? And then have. <laughs> Have, can I, Dad, please, can I have? And it's always very, very important. And there's no time. You have to, now is when, when I need, I have to have it. And of course, as a parent, prices have changed. So then that gives you the right to give a dissertation on what things cost. <laughs> and, and, and that's when you know you're winning, because you look at the kid while you're talking, and, they, and it's very glassy eyes. It's, <laughs> And then there's lying. Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, there's lying. And the children weren't the only ones who lied. Yes. Sometimes uh, the lying... Anyway, getting back to the, uh, to the begging part. Dad, can I... No, no. Come on. Every time somebody... You know what? I did not have children, so you all could change my name to Dad Can I. <laughs> Daddy Can I. How's work? That child isn't good at begging. I'm saying that's. You have to be good at begging when you're little. That's about all you have. You don't have any money, you don't have a job, so you have to beg. Can I keep him, please? Please, please, please. Yeah, please, please, please. please. Mm -hmm. no, 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 wait, 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 wait. You take $30 and get yourself a nice $30 shirt. Could you make it $35? I could make it nothing. <laughs> the kids thought they were slick. <sighs> they were always going to find a way to, you know, to talk their way around, uh, you know, getting what they want. Uh, and it never worked. Denise, leave it up to Dad. You see, when it comes to something we want, Dad always comes through for us. <laughs> Theo? Yeah, Dad. No. Shampoo is in Rudy's eyes, and she wouldn't let me rinse it off like Mom said to, and now Rudy might be blinded for life. <laughs> if she is, can we get a dog? <laughs> I think Vanessa really tried to reason and w made some wonderful arguments, um, which you really couldn't really argue with her. See, the average 16-year-old's allowance is one-tenth of one percent of the average family income. But you and Dad make more than the average salary. So if my allowance were raised to one-tenth of one percent of that, I could be financially independent. <laughs> you know, I don't think Olivia lied and begged. I just think she gave a look and she got what she wanted. What makes you think you're going to get a pony for your birthday? Well, last year, I wanted a tricycle. Yeah. I got it. Right. This year, I want a pony. <laughs> well, I don't know about all that, see, because last year, I wanted a Maserati. 
for my birthday, and Mrs. Huxtable wouldn't let me have one. <laughs> well, if you tell Daddy and Denise that I want a pony, I'll tell Mrs. Huxtable that you want a Mr. Raggy. <laughs> I think that they manipulated each other definitely because they had the same personality. She was three years old and he was a more mature person, but, you know, deep down they both were like, you know, I'm gonna get you, I'm gonna get you. Mrs. Huxtable is tough. You understand? Yeah. yeah. and she doesn't care about, you know, little cute faces. So, so I'll be Mrs. Huxtable. Okay. Okay, I'm sitting here. Mrs. Huxtable? Yes, darling. What's the matter, my little Olivia? Can Dr. Huxtable have a Mr. Raggy, please? Oh, you look so cute and so sad, honey, but the answer is no. <laughs> See, you gotta, you gotta come at, I'm telling you, she's tough. Come on, you gotta go lower. Please, <laughs> Clifford, well, he's a sly fox. <laughs> Sometimes he would break the rule. <laughs> you broke my mug. See, I tried. To... I see what you tried to do with all this old tired-looking glue all clumped up in here together like this. Pieces missing, all chipped up glue on the inside of the cup. But see, I, I did that on purpose. Why? So that you would think that one of the children did it. And Dr. Huxtable, who left the juicer plugged into the electrical socket with the top off? Theo. Look at me when you lie. <laughs> Melissa, you're a lousy liar. Are you telling me the truth? No. That was the ultimate offense, lying. Some of the greatest lies ever told by your kids. No big deal. I forgot. I'll pay you back later. It was like that when I found it. I swear, Mom, Dad, it was like that when I found it. I think everybody was guilty of it a little bit here and there and to different degrees. I don't want to get into trouble. If Dad asks what happened, we'll just say you fell off the bed, which is sort of true because you bounce off the bed right after you hit the wall. I didn't plan to put the makeup on when I went to school. I mean, I was just talking to Rebecca and all of a sudden I had this stuff on my face. It was like temporary insanity. <laughs> Susan and Danielle are going to a real special event tomorrow night and they invited me to come. Oh? It's a place in the village on 14th Street off Union Square. It's called The Exchange. The Cultural Exchange. It's a um, teen Bible club and there's going to be... Uh, I'm not sure if any of the Huxtable kids were really great liars because they all kept getting into trouble. <laughs> I did it. I'm sorry. And I should be punished. We know it, we accept, and you will be. <laughs> How do you know what that punishment is? Did Rudy tell you about that machine in the basement? Look at this. One thing that I cannot abide is when someone is lying and Theo is not telling us the whole truth and I'm going to find him out. He wants to be treated like an adult? Okay, I'll treat him like he's an adult. What are you going to do? You will see. Hey, I'm an adult. You can tell me. Dad, you know, even had to fib a little bit to, to hide something that he didn't want, you know, someone to know about. Cliff still had a boyish part of his character. He was always getting into trouble. I don't think that Dr. Huxtable practiced what he preached to you, Tev. Keep an eye out now.
because he did it. Where did this cake come from? <laughs> he was the first one to go into the kitchen and get what he couldn't have and then try to mani manipulate everybody to get it and sneak his way to having what he wanted. Cliff, uh -huh. are you eating a sausage sandwich? Dear Slate, uh, go, go, go back to sleep. <laughs> the abnormal amounts of fatty deposits on the First begging and then lying. Sad. When we wrote the sandwiches into a show once, I found out that we would actually send an assistant to a special place in Philadelphia. What Bill didn't know is that whenever the writers really wanted one of these sandwiches, we'd write it into the show. At one point, I think, when he started maybe putting on a little weight, the, the word came down to the writers, no more sandwiches. Three, two... <laughs> Who are you? Uh, Theodore Hoxtable. I'm in your geography class. <laughs> the best bloopers are, are Malcolm's bloopers. <laughs> Theo. Hey, Dr. Morgan. How you doing? All right. Have you ever met Theo? <laughs> and I had to pin this this little flower on him, you know. Well, I couldn't get the darn flower to stay. I want you to go out there and read that speech as if you had written it yourself. Make me and your father very proud. <laughs> I kept pinning the thing, and it kept falling off. Make me and your dad proud, OK? okay Let's go. Mom. Let's go. So I guess around the sixth take or so, I just got so frustrated. I tried, Jay. I said the line and pinned the thing, and it looked like it was going to fall. And I put my hand right up like this. <laughs> was screaming because everybody knew what had happened. <laughs> Look at this. Now, I got a chest full of things. <laughs> yeah, but you were laughing when I made a mistake. And I appreciate that you not do that. I'm sorry. Now, where's my kiss? <laughs> and so... I forgot my line. I mean, he's human, man, so it was great to, you know, to watch him lose composure. So, so, bottle, bottle. Oh, well, there were things that we actually did behind the scenes that uh, no one will ever know. <laughs> Guitar. Skiing. Tennis. Uh, 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 ballet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> huh? Let's start with the... What, uh, what are we doing? The, the black pieces off the board. We'll start with you just put it on. Take the black pieces yeah. off? <laughs> When you do a television series based on family, uh, you can stay in that house just uh, so long before even you get tired of seeing the same people. <laughs> and so we began to bring some folks into the house. Kenny came in, and the, the, the thing I love about Kenny is, I, I don't know if he was in love with Rudy. You know, I, I don't know how he, she had no teeth. Uh, <laughs> 
And of course, B.B. King came by, Dizzy Gillespie, and people would say, listen, how did all those people get in your house? Well, the answer is very simple. They came by. Hi, I'm Claire, I'm Denise's mother, and this is our family. I'm Sandra, Denise's older sister. Alvin, Sandra's husband. Francine, Alvin's mother. Lister, father of Alvin. Grandma Anna. Her husband, Grandpa Russell, on Cliff's side. Cliff is my husband, Denise's father. So you always wanted to be related to this family. I remember those were the moments. Um, you always wanted to be related. You always wanted to be invited over to the crib for dinner. Hi, Janet. Hi, Vanessa. Rudy, really darling. No! <laughs> Hi, Dr. Hudson. Is it true that things are going to be happen? Because I think it is. I think that we're the ones that's going to come true for us. You better have What's the other cat's name? Um, Malcolm's boy? My real name is Walter, but I prefer a cockroach. Cockroach. You really want a cockroach's job. Okay, this is unbelievable. You guys come up with the craziest things to do here. I love this house. Who is this? This is Bud. <laughs> Rudy and Bud. If you were married to me, would you go to Boston? First of all, I'm not going to marry you. You would if I told you to. <laughs> it was just hilarious because they had two kids having such grown-up conversations. You have to earn my love. <laughs> A man doesn't have to earn love. A woman gives it to him automatically. <laughs> not this woman. What Kenny did for the show was everyone looked at the kids as so perfect and so family, and I think what he provided for the show was that alter ego. My brother always said, when you leave a woman, don't look back. My brother says, a man doesn't want to see a woman doing a man's job unless she's wearing a bathing suit. One of the things that was funny was to come up with a character like Elvin, or like Kenny, who seemed very free about having, like, uh, dinosaur era rules about men and women. This is one job I'm not confused about. What do you mean? This is a man's job. <laughs> What's a man's job? Opening a jar when a woman can't do it. Really? I didn't know that. My hands must be a little slippery. Thank you. He's a macho nerd. He's a strange mixture of uh, male chauvinist and um, insecure intellectual. Well, let me try. No, Sandra, I can do it. No, come on, Elvin. Sandra, I think it. I'm perfectly I think that Elvin is what made that whole, it completed my role on the show, and it completed much of, of the family. Bill also liked to uh, have people uh, act on the show who'd never acted before. Peter, my man! Well, how are you doing? <laughs> Peter running out of the house was basically what we do with him all the time. He never said a word, he just run out of the house. I realized I got a little bit over my head and too deep a little bit, so I had to get out of there. Whenever he'd do a scene, he'd always be running. I'd let it blow over and I'll come back. He was so funny. He was just such a cute kid. You just had to look at Peter, watch the back of Peter's head as he ran out, and it was just comedy. And part of that was because Peter would never remember his lines. Oh, Peter, that's no problem going to the dentist. Why don't you want to go? Okay. I think this was Adam Sandler's first uh, television appearance. In fact, Adam could be the only character on The Cosby Show to ever utter a Yiddish word. When I tell Roxanne there's no helicopter, she is gonna plot. <laughs> It really did make my parents feel comfortable with the fact that I was an actor. And they were like, well, the kid got on the Cosby show, all right. Is this the Huxtable residence? That's Naomi Campbell. Hey, Theo was in love with her. <laughs> a lot of people who have made a name for themselves now started out on Cosby. Mark's going to major in a central state. 
There were a lot of celebrity guest stars. What does eyeliner have to do with the birthing process? That's all I want to know. <laughs> Uh, buzz it, me tell you some more. And it was sort of like a who's who, you know, you'd walk into that dressing room and you never knew who was going to be sitting there. Well, you know who's responsible? The magic. And we always had fun with guests, always. Stevie Wonder, when we, when we sing with Stevie Wonder, I mean, that's just unbelievable. Vanessa, that's a pretty name. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, madam. Lena Horne was, was amazing. Look at this beautiful family. To be as young as I was and, you know, find her so sexy. The one who's my favorite was Sammy Davis Jr. because he had a Pac-Man machine in his room. And that's all you need is to be my friend. May I say that is a stunning outfit. Thank you. I loved when Dizzy Gillespie came on the show. I think that music and art was really important to Mr. Cosby, and so that was really great, I think, not only for us, the exposure to all of those people and to see who his friends were, but also to an American audience. I gave you a brand new car. But she said you want a Cadillac? <laughs> it took me years after that to actually appreciate being on screen with B.B. King playing behind you. Like, I know jazz musicians right now that would kill themselves to do that. You live in my penthouse. And you said it was a shack. Cause I gave you seven children. Now you want to give them back. I'll get the honey, baby. <laughs> I'm a sister, Jerry, baby. I love you nothing but the blue. Baby, how blue can you? We would get the script on Monday, and I'm reading through, and we get to, towards the end, and it says, you know, Elvin imitates Cliff. And I'm like, oh, excuse me, um, really? <laughs> I don't do an imitation of Bill Cosby. <laughs> By Thursday, you know, I worked on it all week, you know, um, and Thursday, I, I had to do it. I am your father. If it was not for me, you would not be able to pay for the air that you are breathing. <laughs> You will see me do some major dancing on your face. <laughs> One of the things that Bill said he wanted a wife who could speak Spanish. When she would just lose it, she would just start speaking in Spanish. Cuantos 25? I know me, Dave. Felicia walked in the door, and I just knew how wonderful she was going to be. So finally, I said, Do you speak Spanish? No big deal. Do you speak Spanish? Si. <laughs> I always thought that was a really wonderful uh, character element that unfortunately didn't, didn't stay, and I don't know why. Well, what happens when a force of rational meets a force of irrational. The strongest person, either the irrational or the rational one, will win. And if you run these clips, you will see how our strength works against their strength. They are the irrational people, and we be rational. <laughs> I delivered so many babies, after a while, the babies I delivered started having babies. <laughs> I come out of the hospital, go to get my car, and the three babies that I delivered stole my car. I don't think a black family had ever been shown on television and economically at this level. And so the, the husband was a doctor and the wife was a lawyer. Mr. Cosby wanted his wife to be intelligent and accomplished. I have an invoice here which states that the serial number on the rebuilt engine is RN7294938. Is that correct? 
Uh, if that's what it says, then that was the number on the engine. Your Honor, I'd like to submit this invoice as Exhibit A. She's sharp. Not bad looking either. <laughs> he delighted in her intelligence. He delighted in her wit. He marveled at that. He loved that about her. So you leave me with no choice. Here. What's this? Summons? Brilliant. <laughs> you were charged with the telling of half-truths and other crimes against your parents. Magnificent. <laughs> He knew how to prod you along by using that sense of humor. I think he was strict. He was very stern, uh, strict, because he had very high expectations. You're going to start school, learning the mind, education. Aren't you excited? I'm excited. No, no, get excited, my boy. Come on, excited. Excited? I'm excited. Say you're excited. I'm excited. Let me see you get excited. I'm excited. Stand up. Yes, I'm all right. Excited. All right, I'm excited, my boy. Yes. Hey. I'm excited. You're excited. Good. Excited. Cliff and Claire, they've got to constantly respond at any given moment to what this child is going through or what, what's happened when you step out when you step out the door in the morning. You don't know what's gonna happen. And so we threw a lot of curveballs at them. We got married. So I'm talking about what to do is now even if Cliff, you don't stop, want to stop, go to Cliff, college, stop, 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 stop. To her this child has to just said that she is married. Who said that? <laughs> yeah, man, I got married, you know. Tied the knot. Da 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 Among the millions of lessons that um, we've all learned from the Cosby Show is you can't have five children and have peace. I think that dad would lose his cool when, again, it was just really those ordinary stupid things that, that kids do, and you expect more out of them. Well, 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 well. To do what? <laughs> what is the trouble? Dad, I need you. No, 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 no. Okay, wait, okay. Oh. Okay. Nothing to do with the Oh my God! Hey. We did many episodes where he just wanted to be alone, have a day off, read a paper, you know, fall asleep on the couch. Hi, Rudy. Hi, Mommy. I didn't do it. <laughs> Why did you do this? I wanted to see if Daddy could look like a woman. <laughs> Clear. <laughs> Hey, how you doing? I'm oh, fine. <laughs> what you laughing at? Cliff, you are so beautiful. And you're beautiful, too. No, Cliff, you are really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Go to the mirror and look. <laughs> so here he had these children who were underachievers, and yet they had parents who were successful. So it was always Cliff's theme with them that, look at what we do, we work hard, we're disciplined, and that's why we have all this. But it was a lesson the kids didn't get that easily. I'm not going to medical school. Huh? I've decided not to go, I don't want to be a doctor. No, I don't understand. I'd like to open my own wilderness store. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? No, I, I think it stinks. Dad, 
And I'll tell you why it stinks, Pally. Uh, it's clear. Huh? We need to talk. No, no, we're not, we're not going to talk because I want to tell him why it stinks. Yes, but we need to meet in the kitchen first. No. Well, Mom would lose her cool, I think, when we would do something that we didn't really live up to our full potential or something that, uh, you know, disappointed her or something that was just, just really plain stupid, you know, that someone should, should know better. Mom? Yes. I'm not going to law school. What? I decided not to go to law school. Sandra, what are you saying? You have always wanted to go to law school. You've never talked about anything else. I changed my mind. Change it back. <laughs> After all the money we spent sending you to Princeton? Sandra, you owe us $79,648.22. I want my money now. I'm not going anywhere till I get my money. I'll take whatever she's got. Empty her pockets. So there was a constant struggle between parent and child, and a sense that if you didn't keep a close enough eye on your kids, they could bring the whole family down. <laughs> what? Where's Rudy? <laughs> I gave her away. This is Denise's answering service, okay? I'm a father, okay? So don't wait for the beep. Now, you got something to say? Oh, I must be losing my mind. I've been in the courtroom all day, and I've not slept for nights. And the last thing I need is to babysit two little yelling twins. <laughs> the dumbest thing I ever heard. <laughs> From a, a fashion iconic point of view, um, the Cosby sweaters, with definitely the flavor. So the great diversionary tactic for a waistline that's not 34 anymore. He knew how to wear the sweater well, where I was kind of goofy looking. I got laughed at a lot. He had to be the best sweater model ever in history of sweater models. I couldn't wait to get my hand-me-down. Go all the way back in time, and I'm sure you will find some parents who will say to the children, Turn that noise down. I don't care if they're just singing out loud, no radio, no TV. Turn it down. And then eventually you will have children and your children will be too loud and you'll say the same thing that you promised you would never say to your children if you had some children. Which means that every generation will sooner or later lie to itself. <laughs> Take a look, check it out, huh? Uh, you got some old favorites there. Old Yeller again? <laughs> well, it gets better, dear, the more you see it. Don't you like the part where he goes, oh? I realized, my goodness, this show has, is going to have great appeal to a wide spectrum of people because the kids saw what they wanted to see and the adults saw what they wanted to see. Dad, let me explain something. No, don't explain. I don't want to explain. Nine-year-olds today aren't like when you were nine. Corny things were in then. <laughs> like stories about dogs. Oh, woo, woo. <laughs> it's a new age, Dad. <laughs> Get with it. <laughs> Music was a part of life. He liked salsa. He liked the blues. He loved jazz. Now listen to me. <laughs> Justine, Justine. <laughs> it's 22 below zero. 
The wind is blowing fierce. You're freezing and you're cold, and the only person who can open that door for you is Justine. <laughs> Justine, Justine. All right. Now, wait. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Now, we got to just you, you, you. You got to call. You got to call. You got to hit that big note. Get inside now. Come on now. Pim, paddle, 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 construction music though that's what he called the music that the children were listening to he called it construction music you know dad if you just gave this music a chance you might get into it really <laughs> oh what a thrill dad, if you just listen to what he's trying to say what is he trying to say <laughs> that the world is closed. The world is closed. The world is closed. Could they open it up and let it out? They all, you know, were learning that at the same time and going through their childhood again. Oh, let me hold your ears. I say, countrymen. Oh, let me hold your ears. No, I'm Marcus and Twins, but they call me Mark. I didn't come to bite. You see, I came to bark about the holes that the brothers put in Julius C. As far as I'm concerned, it was cool with me. You see, Buddha and the boys must know what they were doing. We would often during the week listen to what the kids were really saying and doing in between takes and when they were just goofing around. And a lot of language would come from just really observing. What are you doing? Just chilling. <laughs> Chilly down or cool back or whatever these people say. Existential, my brother. Not to mention pragmatic. <laughs> I'm bugging. I have no idea what you're talking about. The 80s, period, it was just, it was just corny. No way I'm wearing this. Christine's gonna laugh at it. But think about the clothes and the hair. <laughs> we want it to look like that. We said, this is how we want to look. As far as Sabrina saying that we picked our own clothes, that's funny. That's completely not true. So I had to put some stuff on I really was not feeling. Oh! Pretty soon, everybody will be dressing weird and changing their hairstyles every other day. <laughs> Hello, Daddy. Wear it when I'm dead. I think that the grandparents were there to show uh, a sense of history and to keep a sense of perspective. That's a pretty hat, Grandma. Thank you. That was high fashion back then. Especially if you were a hipster. What's that? A hipster was someone who knew the latest dances and the latest sayings and wore the latest clothes. We could straighten up and fly right. <laughs> Are you hip to the job? Solid. Then slip me some skin. <laughs> Beautiful. They are learning from us, and we're learning from them. They're learning history, and we're learning change. One of the episodes I'll never forget. To your hands of earring and Heathcliff's not too happy about that. <laughs> what really happened to your ears, son? Huh? I walked into a door. Oh, come on. I heard that old oh, walked into a door line from your dad back in 49. <laughs> okay, Grandpa. I got my ear pierced. On purpose? <laughs> And then Heathcliff remembers that he, he used to conk his hair because that day that was the style for the, you know, the guys who were cool. This man, a future doctor, <laughs> had it poured slowly over his head. But what happened? Burned all my hair. It wasn't that bad. He must have been like that girl. Well, whatever happened to her? She's in the kitchen now. Mom, you burned all the hair off your head for Mom. 
I had a tattoo. I mm -hmm. went to get a tattoo when I was coating Anna and in love with her. He did what? When I heard what Russell had done, I was enormously flattered. <laughs> Until I saw my name was misspelled. <laughs> the three Huxtable men. Scar chest, skinhead, and hole in the load. Starting with Grandma, uh, Grandpa. We followed in the perfect footsteps of Mom and Dad. Um, honey, it's happening. It is really? I saw the top of the head. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it was the prettiest little top of the head I ever saw. <laughs> Whose top of the head did it look like? I mean, I remember the birth episode. Um, there was a scene that was not written. No, I'm not going to be blaming anyone. I'm just, I'm looking forward to every day that I'm going to get to spend with them. Yeah, that's so wonderful. Spoken just like a woman whose children are only 45 minutes old. <laughs> and he says, we're going to just do this scene. He says, just go along with me. You know how much I love you. Yeah. But I just also want to say how much I've loved having you as a father. Am I going somewhere? No, no. no. <laughs> I only hope and pray that I can do as good a job with my children as you've done with yours. Well, i tell you something. It's impossible. <laughs> and I think for all the children, we wanted, we had these great, uh, there were great expectations for us, and we wanted to live up to them. Because it was such a close-knit community and environment within the family, Cliff and Claire were able to, to bridge the generation gap. And having all that extended family, the grandparents, so many generations around together supporting is very important. I am your grandfather. This is the first time we've had a chance. I am your grand... <laughs> Help me out. What are we looking at? Disguised pregnancy is very interesting. Why are these bags blocking her? Stop it. It's amazing how creative people become. There was a scene that I played behind a giant teddy bear for no apparent reason whatsoever. The kitchen counter was raised about um, four or five inches. And there was a hole cut in the mattress in the master bedroom. And I would fit down into the hole <laughs> so as to disguise this pregnant belly that I had. Ladies and gentlemen, baby stomach. Five. <laughs> Next week we have a car in here. <laughs> so you see, it's right there. <laughs>
cherish most is being able to do, perform a work that is meaningful, that has lasting meaning for people who see it. The Cosby Show was exceptional with its strong points, intelligence, honesty, respect for its audience, truth of character, reality of relationships, and the strongest point of all, subtlety. We didn't have to wave banners, beat drums, sing songs, make great speeches about who we were. It was obvious. It was obvious in the art that hung on the walls. It was obvious in the music that we listened to, the music that the children listened to, in our personalized story of historical events. And in presenting ourselves in this way, we were able to give people in this country and the world a broader perspective of what American culture really is diverse. Now it's 600. $600 against you, sir. Will you say seven? $700 now. $800 I have. Still the ladies' bid at 800. Will you say nine? $900 in front. Now a thousand. One thousand dollars I have over here. Hey, now. Look at this, my daddy's picture. <laughs> well, I have one thousand dollars in a young lady who loves her daddy. Will you say eleven hundred, sir? That's uh, eleven hundred dollars I have. I think what he was trying to do is just really on a subliminal level expand the horizons of, of everyone. If you sit and you watch the shows, it's there. It's either going to come up in conversation, it's going to come up in music, it's going to come up, it's going to be on our walls, it's going to be in a shot. My name is Nolenhaus. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have a cold? <laughs> no. That is my name in Tosa, Nolenhaus. Oh, very interesting name. My name is Olivia. In Tosa, that would be and in delivering this truth to the audience, it really opened doors to understanding. And it introduced cultural realism in primetime television. What really happened besides the heat and the, and the singing? Leo, I'll tell you what you should put in that paper. I remember we were doing a script uh, about uh, the march to Washington, and I just happened to mention, which was true, that I was on the march. Mm, me too. The mood of that day. Oh, Theo, it was, it was so friendly. Yes, yes it was. People we didn't know at all, waving to each other like they were old friends. We were old friends by the time we walked from the parking lot to the great wall. <laughs> The writers, they even came over and, and thanked me for telling them my experience. One of the criticisms being that the Huxtables did not accurately reflect black life, that reflects a quite limited viewpoint on who we are as black people. Vanessa, what happened? Two girls at school were picking on me. What did they do to you? They started saying nasty things like stuck up rich girl. I told them they better not say it again. And the next thing I know, we're rolling around on the floor. You took both of them on? <laughs> well, I didn't mean to. It just happened. All right. None of this would have happened if we weren't so rich. Let me get something straight, OK? Your mother and I are rich. You have nothing. <laughs> it had such a wide range of what black life is about, and it, uh, and it got to, it, it gets to a point where it's not even about black. Well, I think the significance of The Cosby Show is that it let the world know that black folks are just like everybody else. We feel, we think, we laugh, we hurt, and it was funny. Who is it? No, no, no. When I say... 
who is it, it doesn't mean for you to come in. When I say who is it, and you say who it is. <laughs> who is it? Who it is? <laughs> and I think America's just, after a while, stopped looking at it as a black family, just looked at them as, as a family. And I think that was a big step forward. One day when a, an elderly Sicilian American woman came up to me and said, oh, I love your show. Your show, it reminds me so much of my family. There was a Sicilian American woman saying that. That was, that had a great impact on me. I realized then and since then many times how important the show was. The Cosby Show, like All in the Family and I Love Lucy was history breaking. They were funny, truthful, and people related to them. We built a show around Bill's philosophy, universal in its message that we are all alike when it comes to dealing with parenthood and children. In my first meeting with him, he said, and I mean all six foot three of him with the cigar, he said, this is how it's going to be. And what he talked about was the fact that we were going to have a really well integrated set and that um, the majority of the people working on the show would be African Americans and that is what happened. Bill Cosby changed the culture of television forever. You got scared when I yelled, didn't you? <laughs> okay, here we go. You know. Huh? You're all right. <laughs> I definitely have one favorite scene. There's a scene when um, the anniversary of the parents and they singing and everybody's like lip syncing. You know the night time. It's the right time. The funniest part was Keisha, Night Pulliam. She couldn't have been more than four or five years old. And when it got to that point, And the funny thing, looking back, I'm singing such in a grown-up adult verse. And it was nothing Rudy had ever known or experienced it, but she would have thought that this little girl knew the pangs of love. Bill Cosby and the Cosby Show, it truly, truly was historic. I think that it changed not only television, but it, it changed the way people, in many ways, as crazy as it sounds, viewed African-American people. There were newspaper articles on little black kids who said they wanted to be a doctor. And you asked them why, and they said, because Dr. Huxable is a doctor. The final episode was Theo's graduation. Well, at the end of the episode, Cliff and Claire were in the living room and the music was playing and he asked her to dance. And Bill whispered in my ear, I'm going to dance you right out of this studio. I think one of the beautiful things about the way that show ended, you see Cliff and Claire walk off the set out of the studio doors. They walk past the audience, past the camera, past crew. I just thought it was such a classic farewell. It was one of the most amazing moments in my life. And walking out of that door for the last time, well, it was the happiest time of my entire life. So I figured, well, whatever happens now has got to go down. It's like the house you grew up in. I mean, you know, these people I'd known my whole childhood. You know, I saw them more than I saw my own family a lot of times. And for eight years, we, we genuinely loved each other. There was a, a, a sincere rapport that we have that is, anyone would tell you, is quite rare to have on any show. I was so used to being with these people every day for like three years, and then it's just gone. I'm most proud of being part of um, monumental television history. You know, there are only four other Cosby kids on Earth. Because you had a lot of impact on a lot of different people's lives across this world. And um, it was an experience that 
parallels really no other. Simply put, truthfully stated, the whole thing was wonderful. I just want all of you people to understand something. I never had to worry because I had a catcher. So I could go off and I could do a one and a half and triple thing and then all I had to do was put my hands out and she'd go back. She was there, she was right there. And she envied Mrs. Cosby and she always tried to never do anything that would go off. And, and she would say to me something, well, do you, would Mrs. Cosby do this? And it became kind of troublesome. <laughs> but the beauty of working with a woman with the intelligence, the passion, and the knowledge, and then to watch no nominations for anything. When you put it up on what you're looking at now, she doesn't need it. Thank you for joining us. It's been fabulous. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>